Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, Time and Uncertainty session. Um, we're going get, to get right started here. Uh, our first talk uh, is by uh, Luke Hunsberger and uh, Roberto Posenato. Posenato, okay, great. I'll let you introduce the, the title and okay. go from there. Thank you. Uh, well, our work is on uh, a variant of simple temporal networks called conditional simple temporal networks. And also, we're interested in bounded reaction times. So just to give you a context, uh, a conditional simple temporal network uh, is a model that can be used for uh, analyzing temporal workflows. And we'll talk about what they contain. But the key property that, they have, that is important for them is called dynamic consistency, basically the existence of an execution strategy that will allow you to uh, get where you want to be. Uh, last year, we introduced a sound and complete DC checking algorithm for CSTNs based on the propagation of labeled constraints. And although it's exponential time, it tends to run well in practice. Uh, and at the same conference, uh, Komen and Rizzi introduced uh, the concept of epsilon dynamic consistency, where epsilon greater than zero is a lower bound on reaction time. So if you make an observation, you can't make a decision based on that observation uh, before time epsilon has elapsed. And they introduced also an exponential time DC epsilon DC checking algorithm, uh, but based on a very different approach that was on the conversion uh, to a hypertemporal network. And although they hadn't uh, implemented it yet, I believe they may have implemented it at this point. So the contributions of our paper uh, first of all, well, we provide an equivalent semantics for epsilon DC. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, it turns out to be um, the different characterization turned out to be more useful to us as far as proving uh, completeness in particular. And then um, we uh, extended our previous algorithm so that it uh, works for epsilon DC checking. So it's still based on the propagation of labeled constraints. And uh, we provide a basic empirical evaluation. So just to give you some background, uh, simple temporal networks, probably most of you know about them. Here are some of the graphical depictions of them. Uh, they're basically time point variables that take on real values. And then uh, the temporal constraints are binary difference constraints. So y minus x less than or equal to delta. You represent that in the graph as a directed arrow from x to y with length delta. And then you know you can have a duration constraint that would use two arrows, one for the upper bound, one for the lower bound. And sometimes you also see this notation where you have intervals uh, notated. Uh, also, uh, importantly, uh, there's a time point we usually call z, which is fixed at 0, uh, which is useful in a number of ways. Uh, primarily for us, uh, lower bound constraints, so x greater than or equal to some bound a, would be represented as, uh, did I get that wrong? I think that's supposed to be z minus x less than or equal to minus a. So sorry about that. That's a typo. Uh, but the lower bound constraints, you see them in the graph as an arrow from x to z with a negative uh, value. So that would be x greater than or equal to a. And that's uh, useful for the earliest first strategy that we use uh, to prove completeness. So the consistency of a simple temporal network, the basic theorem is that the network is consistent if and only if its graph has no negative loops, if and only if the all pair of shortest path matrix has zeros down its main diagonal. And you can do that in order n cubed time using floyd Warshall or Bellman-Ford or a variety of other algorithms. With conditional simple temporal networks introduced by Tsamardinos et al. in 2002 and 3, uh, you have the same thing as in STNs, but you add observation time points. And so each observation time point, uh, when you execute it, it generates a truth value for a propositional letter. So for example, in a medical domain, uh, you take somebody's blood pressure and you get the result that it's either high or low. And depending on those results, you may want to follow a completely different treatment pathway uh, and have uh, different uh, constraints apply. So uh, in the CSTN graph, time points and temporal constraints will be labeled by conjunctions of propositional literals. And they will only be applicable in scenarios where their labels are true. So you may find out that for high blood pressure and other tests that you follow one set of constraints and otherwise another set. Uh, 
So a little bit more detail the notation. We have propositional letters, P, Q, R, S, T. They take on Boolean values. Uh, each P has a corresponding observation time point, which we usually notate capital P question mark. So that's the time point, observation time point. And executing P question mark generates a truth value for P, either true or false. And then you get uh, labels, propositional labels that look like that on the time points and constraints. And during execution, you only know the observations that you've seen so far. So you may know the value of P and Q, but not R, S, and T. Here's an example of a CSTN. Uh, here, P and Q are the observation time points. The dashed lines are uh, edges that are generated by our algorithm. Um, but just to back up a bit, if P happens to uh, come out to be true, then uh, Q would be an applicable time point. And Y has no label, so it would be applicable. But W is only applicable in scenarios where P is false. V is only applicable in scenarios where both P and Q are true. And these various constraints uh, have propositional labels that you need to satisfy in those scenarios. Now notice here, though, that we have a negative loop. But the labels are mutually inconsistent. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the network itself is not dynamically consistent. In fact, this network is dynamically consistent. All right, and we'll see how you can find that out. So a dynamic execution strategy, the execution decisions, you can react to observations after some delay. Um, and it's called dynamically consistent if there exists a strategy that guarantees that all applicable or relevant constraints will be satisfied no matter which scenario is incrementally revealed over time as you make more and more observations. And then, as I said last year, we presented a sound and complete propagation-based algorithm. So here's a, an example of an earliest first strategy, execution strategy for this network. So we execute P at time 10. If P happens to be true, then we need to satisfy this constraint y greater than y minus p is greater than 7, so we can execute y at 17. And then q can be executed at 20. If q happens to be true, then we'll execute d, otherwise we'll execute u. But on the other hand, if p is false, all that goes away, and we just execute y at 15, because we need to satisfy this upper bound constraint. And then we can also execute w at 20. So we get uh, an execution strategy reacts to the observations. And the key thing here is that this reaction time, you know, you execute P at 10, and we have to make a decision within five units because we want to make sure that we don't violate this upper bound constraint. Uh, so if we had to react before time five elapses from this, then we'd run into problems because we wouldn't know the truth value of P. So Cummins and Rizzi uh, last fall introduced uh, epsilon greater than zero as a lower bound on the strategy's reaction time. The idea is that decisions that depend on the value of P must be made at least epsilon after you learn the value of P. And they did present an algorithm uh, that was based on converting a uh, temporal network to an exponential number of other networks and uh, using hypertemporal networks and so on. Um, the sample. Uh, CSTN that we saw is epsilon dc for epsilon equal to 3. You, if you can react within time 3, you, can, you don't have to worry about that uh, loop because you learn the value of p at time 10. And then <coughs> at time 13, you're able to react. Well, we can react it and either execute y at, fi at uh, 15 or 17 as we need to. So uh, with epsilon equal to 6, uh, we can't react in time. All right, so our contributions, I uh, already showed you these, but just to remind you, we get an equivalent semantics, which is useful for approving our theorems, and we give a new, an update of our algorithm that handles this epsilon uh, DC. Now, I'm not going to go through this, but those of you who have seen the semantics for uh, the conditional temporal problem that Samardinos et al. Uh, introduced, you'll recognize the use of uh, different sets, and uh, the uh, main thing that's troubling about this is that this is not commutative, and so I, I just didn't find it useful for our theorems that we needed to prove, so we provide an alternative semantics uh, that's more like the uh, approach that Morris et al. introduced in uh, 
2001 for STNUs, where you talk about the history uh, of a given time. So uh, the history of a given time t would take into account all the uh, observations that you make, at least epsilon before time t. And the idea here is that if a strategy sigma in the scenario S1 executes x at time t, and that was a mouthful, and the history at time t under this scenario is the same as the history in a different scenario, uh, then the strategy has to execute x at that same time uh, in that other scenario as well. And this is what ensures that your execution decisions cannot depend on observations made less than epsilon away in the past. So the proofs of all that is in the, is in the paper. Here's the propagation rules for our algorithm from last year. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of these, but just uh, there's a couple things to notice. Uh, one is that they're not length preserving. We get, if you have an edge of length v here, you get a new edge of length max v or w. So there's some interesting interplay between the constraints. It has to do with you know the observations. The new ones are in red, and you notice that there's not uh, big changes. We have, uh, instead of w less than 0, we have w less than epsilon in a few places. And the value of the weight changes a little bit. So the key thing, you know, the contribution is, well, OK, it was you know, painstaking to figure out which minor changes we needed to make. But also to prove completeness turned out to be uh, quite an involved extension. So a labeled constraint looks like this. Uh, that y minus x less than or equal to delta must hold in scenarios where L is true. This is our symbol for the empty scenario. So that constraint would have to hold in all scenarios if labeled by the empty uh, label. Here's an example that looks a lot like uh, traditional constraint propagation. You have an edge of length 3, edge of length 4, and so you get an edge of length 7. The new thing is that uh, you can join the propositional labels. And so this particular rule if the conjunction was inconsistent, you wouldn't generate that rule, that new edge. Uh, rules that are different that uh, arise from the uh, properties of uh, observations. You know, if you're going to observe p at least eight units after x in scenarios where p is true, well, that's also, also going to uh, be applicable when p is false, because you won't know the value of p before you execute p. So uh, that's what we call rule r0. Uh, on the other hand, if epsilon is equal to 5, that rule does not apply to this situation where uh, uh, the value here is a positive number 8, uh, because 5 is less than 8. Uh, the idea here is that if you learn the value of p, and it turns out to be false, x equals 20 is actually OK. You have time to react. So we wouldn't want to extend that by generating the more general label. But if epsilon is equal to 10, you would make that. So th there's these kind of you know small changes that need to be made to the propagation rules. Uh, here's another one, the R3 star rule. These numbers on the rules were because you know we eventually weeded out ones that we didn't need. Uh, and this one's interesting because it spreads the value of this edge over to that edge. And there's a, a theorem called the spreading lemma, which uh, is very useful in proving completeness because it turns out to spread the uh, lower bounds across all the unexecuted time points in certain cases. And that turns out to be quite useful. OK, and so if the epsilon is equal to 2, you get a different weight there. Now, another thing about the uh, existing algorithms that it deals with Q labels, which contain literals uh, P question mark. And what that stands for is uh, that a constraint would have to hold as long as P is unknown. So in the dynamic setting, until you execute P question mark, you don't know the value of the propositional letter P. And so sometimes your decisions will depend on that. And so in this case, where we have negative edges and the this terminates at z, uh, we, get, we do get these values. The idea being that if q is false and this has, constraint has to hold and q is 
true and this constraint has to hold, then as long as Q is unknown, both of these constraints have to hold, and so you get the propagation. So different kinds of propagation than you may be used to. So those are the rules again. So uh, in the paper, we prove soundness and completeness. And we prove completeness by constructing an earliest first strategy and proving that it works when the algorithm says the network is epsilon DC. Uh, and it's interesting that the earliest first strategy turns out to be a, quite a bit more complicated in the case of epsilon dynamic consistency because you know, if you execute P at time 10, it doesn't mean you can't execute something at time 11. It's just that the execution decision to do that can't depend on the value of P. So there's a little trickiness there. Anyway, uh, to uh, evaluate this, which is a challenge, we used uh, what's called the ATAPAS toolset for specifying time-aware process schemas developed by other people, not us, in Germany. And it's not easy to use this tool, but uh, we had hoped that it would provide realistic uh, CSTNs. And one of the challenges is in randomly generating uh, CSTNs for experiments. It's not easy, but uh, you know we we did it and uh, we used the tool set. It takes a long time to use it, and uh, we set up the experiment. And the number of time points uh, between 40 and 179, number of observation time points between three and nine. Uh, it turns out that the non-epsilon DC networks uh, this runs much faster because usually you find the inconsistency much faster than you would uh, for the ones that turn out positive. And here's an example of, of the results in that there's a gray curve there that's uh, a cubic curve, which is just there for reference. Uh, the algorithm, in worst case, is undoubtedly exponential. But in practice, at least with these kinds of uh, networks, it, it seems to run in a reasonable amount of time. So that's what makes us think that the algorithm can be of practical use. For example, to the ICAPS community, which have long been using STNs, but we hope, you know, that with the use of STNUs and CSTNs, that you'll also start to incorporate them. All right, so there's our contributions again. But uh, for future work, uh, clearly we need uh, benchmarks. It's difficult because, you know, there's not a lot of people. There are a lot of people who are interested in using CSTNs, but have not yet used them. Uh, but there's a... Uh, so there's a need for uh, benchmarks, randomly generated suites of CSTNs. We want to do more empirical evaluation. Um, we are currently working on a, a paper that extends this approach of propagation uh, to CSTNUs that we incorporate the contingent links from STNUs. And also, we have a paper that was just accepted in the constraints uh, for this fall, uh, the constraints conference. And that uh, takes a completely different approach, one that's more like the uh, two-player game approach in TGA's Time Game Automata. Uh, and that has been shown to be, uh, it looks like it's competitive, and we're already working on improvements to that, hopefully to make it even more competitive. So uh, a lot of good uh, things coming from conditional simple temporal networks and beyond. So thank you. Uh, any questions? Questions? You want to pick? Uh, yeah, the left to right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh. so you, you said just quickly there, you said that uh, you had a lot of difficulty generating these benchmarks. So what makes the benchmarks for other people to... Uh, well, the uh, TAPIS tool set is, is available for use. And I, I guess if you want, we could supply the parameters that we used for the... I mean, they're listed in the paper, the parameters we used, but, you know, if you have any difficulty duplicating those those CSDNs. Roberto is the one to contact. He's sitting right behind you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah? Yeah, I did. It was the same question. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah? So, so I, I understand that where, where your work has been, and I think it's very nice. I have sort of a broader question in the sort of scheduling and planning perspective. It would seem to me that it's fairly difficult to generate CSTNs, right? I mean, I think about the STN case where we're doing planning and scheduling and it runs as a constraint checker or subproblem. Mm -hmm. And so do you have any insight on how to model or automatically generate these CSTNs? Are you talking about randomly or for no, use no, in practical? As, as in a practical... Well, 
where where I'm motivated, uh, where my motivation is coming from, is from the healthcare domain, where you know medical tests produce results, and then there are temporal constraints. You know, like if you do one test, then you may have to wait an hour before you do something else. So that's where m my idea of the structure of CSTNs would come from. And uh, Roberto and his colleague uh, Carlo Combi are active in uh, getting uh, real-world examples from those sorts of. But as far as how to incorporate into a planner, I would need to know what are the test actions that generate information and, you know. I'm just thinking of the complexity of, of your model, your CSTN, that looks non-trivial for someone to actually create a model, but then you're going to apply your algorithms. Well, it's just time points and temporal constraints, like an STM plus this one added feature. And the question is, where do those added features come from? And and I don't know. I would have to talk to you about that. Maybe I your... could uh, ask a related question. Maybe it's sort of the thing. But suppose you have built a uh, CSTN, and yeah. you're, you're moving forward. You get updates. Uh, is it uh, an incremental propagation procedure? Or you know, what happens? Do you just kind of re Oh, during execution? Yeah, yeah. You recheck the network. Uh, and, and I mean, that's the, I think that's the kind of sense I in see, which they... I see. I guess planning is a, is, planning is a different question still, but... Uh, right, well, but as far as execution kind of algorithm. Closing, uh, right. During execution, I mean, we have ideas on, on the execution algorithm that uh, there would be some propagation, but the fact that if you were doing the earliest first strategy, the lower bound propagations are all aimed at Z. Those tend yeah, to be yeah, easier, yeah, exactly. uh, but we haven't... Uh, published any results on that or okay. you know the execution algorithm yeah. but that should be coming soon. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, any other questions? Yes, this will be the last one. Um, yeah. So sometimes these observations may take longer or shorter. Um, would it be easy to let's say, have an epsilon separately for each observation or would you recommend to model that as a, an additional time point in this way? Well the the epsilon is the amount of time from the time you learn the result of the observation to the time you can make a decision based on that. So it's nothing to do with how long it takes to generate the observation. But with a CSTNU, if, for example, you had a medical test that takes between 5 and 20 minutes, but you don't control how long that test takes, then that would uh, be a, like a contingent link in an STNU, and that would be part of a CSTNU, where the contingent link, when it completes, generates the observation. So I think that's how that would be modeled. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, that's cool stuff. Thanks. Okay. How long is that? Pedro. Pedro. Sorry. No problem. Okay, our second talk, uh, Pedro <coughs> Santana, uh, I'll let him introduce his co-authors, uh, entitled Paris, a polynomial time risk sensitive scheduling algorithm for probabilistic simple temporal networks with uncertainty. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Pedro, and this is the work we're going to present today. Paris is a polynomial time risk sensitive scheduling algorithm for PSCNUs. But before I start, I would like to thank all of my wonderful co-authors without whom this work wouldn't be possible. So, this is the outline of today's talk. We're going to start, well, I'm going to start by trying to motivate the problem that motivated this research, and this is in close collaboration with our collaborators at uh, NASA, the Jet Propulsion Lab. Then I'm going to try to motivate uh, the problem of, or I'm going to briefly describe the problem of strong risk or strong scheduling, where uh, you have all sorts of you know, random variables affecting the durations of your activities in your plan. Uh, then find, I'm going to follow with some experimental results that hopefully will show you that our results can be very useful in practice, especially if you're trying to come up with these temporal planners that have a very keen notion of temporal risk when they're trying to schedule their activities. And finally, I'm going to conclude with some conclusions and avenues for future work. All right. So this is the motivating example that kind of like inspired all of this research. So here what we have is we have two rovers, let's call them spirit and opportunity because I'm not very creative. And what they have to do is kind of like what rovers do. So they have to drive around this map and then they, at each site that they visit, they have to perform some drilling of rocks and they have to collect those samples and they have to analyze them. But because, you know, life is hard and temporal durations are not under our control, 
as Professor Hunsberger just pointed out. Um, here we're going to consider a mixture of different uncertainty models for our temporal durations. So some of these are versatile types. So as the robots are traversing, we're going to assume that the temporal duration of these traverses is not completely interdirectional true. And we assume that we have enough data that we could say that these, um, you know, enough simulation data, experimental data from rover missions on Mars, that we could say that these traversals can be map modeled as Gaussian random variables. At the same time, when these robots arrive at these locations, they are going to perform these three activities. So they're going to first drill the rocks, then collect them, and then perform some analysis of the underlying material that they just collected. But because we don't have, we assume like, we don't have a lot of uh, data about how these processes take place on Mars, we're going to assume that they are uncontrollable in the sense that they can take any time between this two, you know, any time between this interval, but we have no probabilistic information in terms of what values are more likely than others. And then once they are completing their mission, so this rover goes out and then goes here, this one visits this location and goes to a relay station. So once they are done, visiting all the sites and collecting all their data, they have to be able to communicate with the satellite, which will be in view during this time window. And once they arrive there, one rover has to transmit its data, followed by the second rover that then will transmit its data. The transmission cannot overlap, but at the same time, they cannot be too far apart so as to maximize throughput. So how do we model this and how do we solve this and how we think this could be useful to you know, the scheduling community at large? So this is our PSTNU representation of this problem. The term PSTNU comes from probabilistic STNU, and basically because it combines probabilistic simple temporal constraints from PSTNs and simple temporal constraints with uncertainty from STNUs. So we we're actually debating what was the correct name for the network. I wanted to call it PSTNs because after all, it's all random variables. But then my co-author said like, no, it's not a PSTN because you have to give me a distribution. So then I just put a P in front of PSTNU. If you have a better name, please suggest it. Um, so as in any uncontrollable duration um, network, we're going to have two types of events. We're going to have controllable events, which are the ones that are up to the agent or the scheduler to choose the times from. And also, we're going to have contingent events, which are going to be represented by these squares. And these squares represent times that nature will pick for you. So you can choose to perform a traversal, but the end time of your activity will be cho sorry, chosen by nature. And we're going to have three types of temporal constraints in this formalism. The first one is, you know, our familiar simple temporal constraints, which are basically, uh, regardless of the type of the temporal event, what they're going to say is any feasible schedule should be such that the temporal difference between these two events is bounded by this lower bound and this upper bound, right? A simple temporal constraint with uncertainty is what comes in STMUs, for example. So instead of just you know, establishing a requirement in terms of what differences in schedule, um, differences in between temporal events the schedule must satisfy. A simple temporal constraint with uncertainty says that the time of the endpoint is related to the time of the start point, which could be controllable or contingent, according to this formula, where D is an uncontrollable random variable for which we have no probabilistic information. However, we know, or we make the assumption that it's bounded within a known interval. And then a simple uh, PSTC, a probabilistic simple, simple temporal constraint, is just like a simple temporal constraint uh, with uncertainty, but we make the assumption that for this random variable here, now we do have information about some sort of probabilistic distribution function. All right? So the input to our system called Paris, and you're going to learn in a second, but I, I really tried to make it be London, but then I couldn't, so it became <laughs> Paris. Um, and you're going to see why. So the input to the system is the temporal network. And then you can ask uh, Paris, say like, hey, is there a strong schedule? And then I can justify, I will justify in a second why we care about strong schedules. <coughs> is there a strong schedule for this network? And if yes, what is the scheduling risk? Because it might be non-zero. So if there is no, it's just gonna say no. But if it's yes, it will give you two things. It will give you a strong schedule because it just has perfect. So it will give you a strong schedule, which actually will guarantee that all of your activities will be executed according to the requirements and will therefore respect uh, the, the constraints in a strong scheduling problem. In addition to that, it will also give you a scheduling risk bound, which is guaranteed to see. So this is basically gonna say, if you execute your plan according to this schedule, the risk of you, for example, missing the temporal deadline of communicating with the satellite 
is guaranteed to be no more than 6.7 percent it, it is usually much less than that so because this has to be a guaranteed bond but since we're also trying to make this tool available for a lot of existing work in strong temporal planning that actually use SDNU reformulations in existing temporal planners um, it is very easy and our tool actually generates that for you um, it also generates an SDNU reformulation with the same risk bound that you can just plug in into an existing temporal problem temporal planning all right so the goal of this talk is a very simple one actually we basically we want to make these temporal consistency checking uh, so the risk aware strong scheduling checking we want to make it very very fast and we're going to do that through linear models and if you don't remember anything from this talk the only thing that i'd like you to remember is whenever you go you know in your research and you consider probabilistic models for your durations and you care about risk before you go for the non-linear op optimizer of your choice carefully think about using linear approximations for those risks because they are actually effective which is exactly what i'm going to try to show today um okay so why should you care about what i'm what i'm saying basically because for example if you take this example the motivating example and you use the state of the art of you know existing ex strong schedule for PSCNs, it will take about seven minutes to compute that schedule that i just showed you if you use paris which stands for polynomial time algorithm for risk aware scheduling that therefore paris it will take 14 milliseconds it actually generates it's the schedules of the same quality so and and therefore because it runs so fast so in your experiments i'm going to show you that sometimes it's up to four orders of magnitude faster than the state of the art and probabilistic scheduling it actually enables real-time online temporal planning with a keen sensitivity to temporal risk which we actually demonstrated in practice during our demo on wednesday so it was running in real time for the people who attended it and we showed it running in fractions of seconds along with all the planning that goes with it all right so for those of you who are not familiar with strong scheduling risk very strong scheduling let me just give you a little bit of background followed by the definition of the problem so this work is inspired basically by these five works mainly uh, a lot of other references but these are some important ones to be aware of so Tsamardino's in his paper 2002 um, he was the first one to kind of like start talking about the notion of temporal or scheduling risk when you're dealing with temporal uh, probabilistic durations and then but it was kind of like it wasn't thoroughly formalized and as far as i know um the first ones to you know make a very systematic study of temporal um of scheduling risk and strong scheduling were thank you and williams where they basically uh, framed the problem as a non-linear optimization where they could basically optimize any objective over the schedule while making sure that it was risk bounded and strong um shortly after this paper came out wang and williams uh came out with an algorithm where they said like sometimes we don't really care about optimizing the objective function over the schedule we just want to check if such a schedule exists and we can do so very efficiently so what they demonstrated is that they could use an smt like structure to check the existence of such schedules um you know a very uh, short amount of time so this is actually this work runs in about one order of magnitude faster than this one and in the experimental results we're going to compare against this one and these are just two problems the ones that i said like so there is uh, um, current interest in strong temporal planning these are these papers are just two examples which use stnus as their, as their uh, scheduling model so that's the reason why we have that stnu reformulation step which you can use to basically plug um, our results into these planners and actually give them a notion of temporal risk out of the box so as I showed you before, a PSG is basically a graph. And a, bra a graph is composed of edges and nodes. So the nodes here are of two types. Some of them are controllable, which you can schedule. Some of them are contingent, which you have to just observe. And the edges are of two types as well. Requirement edges are going to basically represent simple temporal constraints, which define just bounds on your temporal durations in your schedule. And contingent edges will define relationships of this type where d is uncontrollable you either have a probabilistic model for it or you don't it doesn't really matter for the space of all uncontrollable durations we're going to use the note we're just going to call it omega so whenever you see omega you just think every possible outcome of these uncontrollable durations and then since we're going to do linear programming i'm going to try to frame the problem of strong scheduling in a linear programming way which is this one which is actually quite easy so basically strong scheduling is choose a schedule for the things that you can schedule such that this is true 
such. So for if every one of the requirement constraints, the minimum of this difference, which is, so this is a random variable because it might depend on random duration. So the minimum of this random variable is guaranteed to be more than the requirement, um, the lower bound for the requirement constraint. And similarly, the, the maximum of this random variable is less than the upper bound. So I'm not going to go into the, I mean, computing these maxes and mins is, is not particularly hard. It's in the extra slides, but I'm not going to go into that. But what I can say is, as we're trying to compute, as you're trying to formulate these maxes and mins as linear constraints, what usually happens is if you have temporal durations which are very, well, they are spread over very long intervals, it is usually the case that if you say, I want a schedule that works for all its life, the risk of scheduling it is zero. Usually what you're going to get is no solution at all which tends to be not quite useful. So what you can say is, what instead of like considering the whole interval for these temporal durations, let's say for example, one duration that could be modeled as a Gaussian, what if we just consider a subset of the possible, of the possible range defined by two decision variables, which we represent as Li and Ui. So these are externally imposed bounds that we put on these random variables representing temporal durations. But of course, this is an assumption, and as you were cutting out values out of your possible temporal durations that will incur risk. And that's exactly how we're going to define risk. So the scheduling risk is, a, is the probability of any one of these assumptions not holding. So this is basically the probability of the joint distribution of the random variables representing your temporal constraints, your temporal durations, and you know, your scheduling risk is defined as this quantity here. I don't know, if I look at this and every time I see a joint, it's a very nasty thing because you actually have to compute joint distributions of random variables, and that's not necessarily easy. So since here we're trying to do a lin you know, linear approximations and try to use linear programming, what can we try to do? So first, we can try to use Bull's inequality to turn this into a more tractable form, which is actually a function of the cumulative distribution function, which basically here is giving you the probability of the duration being less in the lower bound or greater than the upper bound. And of course, so this is a linear combination of potentially nonlinear functions. So let's try to make it linear. So some typical duration models that we're going to, uh, that we treated in this paper, but I'm going to go through a lot of detail is the simple temporal constraint with uncertainty, which is bounded, but we have no probabilistic information. Also like the Venable Gaussian, which is, you know, we use all the time. The uniform distributions, which are also quite handy when you have actually, if you want to model a Gaussian with high variance. And also inverse Gaussians, which are quite a useful model when you actually have an agent moving at an average speed with Gaussian disturbances on your on its speed. So that an inverse Gaussian is a good model for its time of arrival. So let's look at linear squeezing models for these durations. For SCCUs, unfortunately, because we have no probabilistic information, we can actually do no squeezing of these variables without incurring an arbitrarily large amount of risk. So in this case, the squeezing model has to be no squeezing as well. This is lean. It is actually consistent with the SNU literature. For uniform distributions, fortunately, this, the area under the distribution is a linear function of the squeezings, so we're pretty, we're pretty much done. But for distributions such as this one, like Gaussians or inverse Gaussians, it's, um, it is unfortunately a nonlinear function. But what if we try to do a piecewise approximation of this risk? So. People should be afraid of piecewise approximations because the moment you make a piecewise approximation, you basically break the beauty of your linear program and you have to introduce integer variables, right? But there is something special about the way this distribution looks like. Can everyone guess what it is? Sorry? Um, convex or semi-convex? Close, close. It is actually the property of being unimodal which is very important because in this convex, in this piecewise approximation here, where you basically you have the height of these boxes, that makes those monotonic. <coughs> and why do I care about these things being monotonic? Because basically, if you add this as your linear approximation of the scheduling risk, and you add this as your squeezing bounds, you can implement this without any integer variables whenever the linear risk bound is being minimized or bounded, which is great. Right. You're basically doing a piecewise approximation without any integer variable. So your problem is fully continuous and runs in polynomial time. All right, so it's linear. It is exactly. So Paris has a few formulations that you can do for your problem. In the minimal risk one, you're taking this linear approximation of your risk bound. You're imposing the uh, strong controllability constraints. And then because 
it uses no integer variables, this thing is guaranteed to run in polynomial time. But you can also have all the useful formulations. For example, instead of minimizing the risk, you could try to minimize some other you know, arbitrary linear objective while bounding the risk to some given bound delta, which is also called the chance constraint. In this case, you know, this will, you know, whatever solution comes out of this is guaranteed to be sound. But the problem is, if the solution to this function does not cause the linear bound to touch this constraint here, this estimate may be very loose. So in the paper, we, we also provide this other formulation that actually allows you to not only optimize some linear objective, but also recover a tight estimate of the risk bound. Um, the details of why this is true are in the paper. And you can also see that by choosing M, you can actually bound the degradation of um, the optimization of your you know, desired objective to no more than this quantity here. So for example, if you choose it should be a thousand times the number of durations, uncontrollable durations in your network, you are guaranteed to be precise up to the millisecond. So some experimental results, we use two available data sets, one from the previous paper, from um, Feng Yu and Williams. Uh, both of these data sets you can download from here. So this is, this is um, a whole bunch of instances of PSCNs. These are even more instances of PSCN used with all sorts of probabilistic models that we use in this experimental validation. And here are some of the results. So here, for the car sharing, you know, the first data set, we compare this against Rubato, the approach by Wang and Williams. And you see that, you know, for small problems for which we can actually have a schedule, Paris and Rubato, even though Paris tends to be faster, they are comparable in, in, in speed. The problem is the moment you start increasing the number of temporal durations and you actually prevent a strong scheduling, a strong schedule from existing, then you see the big gains in terms of performance. And that's where you know the advantages in, in temporal planning come. So this is log scale. So this is what it's showing to you is while Paris basically remains, it never takes more than like one or two seconds to run. Rubato, which is actually an order of magnitude faster than the previous fastest algorithm, can take up to hours to solve that one instance. And that is, I mean, if you have a planner that has to make these checks hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, you might afford something that costs a millisecond to run, but not an hour. Um, this is something that it's, it is in the paper I, I, I can talk to people are, are interested, which is in that piecewise approximation, then there is the question of should you how do you choose that piecewise approximation? You can't just, should you just do it uniformly? Can you do it randomly? So there is a principled way of actually optimizing that approximation. And it's just a graphic to show you that, you know, if you do that optimization that we propose in the paper, uh, it actually makes your risk bound be significantly tighter than what you have done with just a simple naive approximation. This graph here is just to show that, you know, even if for instances or for which there is a strong schedule, even if you have a whole bunch of temporal durations, uncontrollable temperature durations, Paris still runs in less than a second. And this is just to show you that the arbitrary linear uh, objective, for example, make spin, also works very well and actually runs in comparable time uh, when compared to the mi uh, minimal risk version of Paris. So in conclusion, um, so the empirical validation as expected, so since we are departing from a non-linear approach and going to a linear one, we kind of experience dramatic speed ups in terms of uh, compared to the state of the art. But the good thing is, even though we had to make further approximations with our linear models, apparently there was no loss in terms of the number of instances that we could solve and the quality of those solutions, at least as far as the 6,000 instances that I solved. Um, so therefore, and we actually have validated that in practice, Paris can endow existing temporal plans with a keen sensitivity to temporal risk and can be used in practice. It actually is, if you're interested in using, you can talk to me. Um, and hopefully, I mean, these approximations here, we would like to extend them to dynamic controllability, which is arguably the most interesting property of temporal net networks, and potentially using these in other types of optimization that uses unimodal distributions. So thank you very much for the people who funded us, and thank you very much for your attention. So, um, 
So r remind me, so the exponential distribution has kind of a, it, it is unimodal, right? Yeah. Right. Ex exactly. So the paper, so great point. So in the paper, we actually never, so we use a Gaussian as a, like a running example, but all of our developments and all the equations and even the partition optimization algorithm that we do, which uses gradient descent, it is, it just assumes that the underlying distribution is unimodal. If it's unimodal, the only thing you have to do is you have to approximate the left hand, the left side and the right side of the distribution. If it's Gaussian inverse Gaussian exponential or whatever distribution you have in your head, as long as it's unimodal, all of these should apply. So we haven't, so these examples don't have this distribution, but it should be supported by the algorithm as it is. Do you, do you have a question? Yeah. So, <coughs> so typically, right, when people ask us, oh, where do these distributions come from? We'd say from learning. Exactly. But if, <coughs> if you learn them from real data, then you don't really have any good idea of what the distribution looks like, right? Perfect. So that's a great point, which is exactly why we have PSTNUs instead of PSTNs. So this whole work started with me talking to the NASA folks saying like, hey, let's use PSTNs. And then at some point they said like, well, but where do these distributions come from? And they are like, oh yeah, we kind of like, we estimated it's like, no, you need evidence that this is true. So for example, for traversal distributions, NASA has like awesome simulators and you can actually estimate, you can try to generate samples that allow you to gather those probabilistic models. But if you don't, that's where the STCUs or STNUs are useful because basically, they allow you to represent temporal constraints in a much more conservative way. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the, the moment you frame it as a risk aware optimization, the constraint on being risk aware does not allow you to squeeze the simple temporal network, network with uncertainty. So it's completely consistent with what has been before. So that's a perfect point, And that's exactly why we have PST and use instead of PST. Okay, I think we're out of time. <coughs> Thanks. Okay, our uh, last talk of the session, uh, robust partial order schedules for the RCPSP max problem with durational uncertainty. Uh, presentation will be uh, Una. Whoops, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I guess I'm going to give you this. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Na Fu. I'm currently a postdoc from Singapore Manchester University. So in this presentation, I will talk about our paper on robust partial order schedules for SPSP max with durational uncertainty. This is a joint work with Pradeep Barakandam and the Hong Chen Lao from Singapore Manchester University. So for illustration, here is a SPSP instance. Basically, the problem is about involved a set of activities where each activity has a fixed duration and uh, consumes a certain amount of resources during execution. So there are precedence constraints and uh, resource capacity constraints. The objective is to determine start times for all activities such that the total mix span can be minimized. SPSP max extends this problem with the minimum and maximum time lags between pairs of activities. So this is how the problem looks like in a deterministic case. However, in real life, as Morris Law tells us, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. So in the context of project scheduling, also as uh, illustrated by the first two speakers, it means that no matter how well planned the schedule would be, there is always the possibility of failure. So in this work, we consider uncertainty and uh, focus on policy-based proactive scheduling. The scheduling policy we are using in this work is partial order schedule or in short POS. So given a schedule problem, a partial order schedule is a logic sequence of activity execution. So the idea of the sequence is to remove all resource conflicts so that any time feasible schedule generated from the POS is also resource feasible. Existing work for POS construction is through a chaining procedure by Palacia et al. in General Scheduling 209. And uh, in this work, we provide MIT formulations for POS generation and from a risk management perspective. Formally, 
uh, given a risk between zero and one, we are interested in finding a POS with alpha robust mix band, which can be defined as the minimum alpha compound mix band over all POS. So during the uh, generation of POS, we control the risk of failure to uh, meet robust mix band and uh, temporal constraint violation. So to solve this model, we proposed a sample average approximation based MIP formulation and a scalable extension together with a cut generation scheme. So before I introduce the model, uh, let me first uh, talk about the decision variables that we use in, in this model. So X is the resource flow variable, so representing the number of resource K that directly transferred from activity I to activity J. Y here is a sequencing variable used for POS construction. So it is binary. So YIJ equals one means that activity I precedes activity J. X here is a schedule, scheduling variable for, uh, for representing the <coughs> start time of activity I in sample Q. Here is uh, our SA based, based formulation. So roughly speaking, we have a temporal constraint and a resource constraint. We use the binary indicator to represent if the solution POSY can be successfully executed on sample Q or not. So there may be two reasons for the failure. One reason is the temporal constraint violation. The, the other reason is uh, failure to meet robust mix band. To improve, improve the scalability of the model, we give a heuristic extension. So the general idea is we summarize the sample set by using one alpha percentile duration sample. We solve this problem by using Bender's decombination. So the idea is over the three types of decision variables, the sequencing variable y is complicated in taking integer values. So we partition the variables into two parts. x and y goes to the master problem for POS construction. And uh, the scheduling variable s goes to the slave for schedule determination. So at each iteration, the master give a uh, uh, give a solution POS to the slave. Then depending on if the slave is feasible or not, the optimality cards or feasibility cards can be added to the master for guidance in the next iteration. Another feature of our proposed uh, models is the cut generation scheme. So we generate cut by exploring the problem structure. For example, uh, let Tij mean represent the minimum time lags between activity I and activity J. So it specifies that um, activity J can only get started after activity I has already started for this amount of time period. So if it is larger than or equal to the processing time of activity I, which, which means that activity J can only get started after activity I uh, has finished. Then we add cut YIJ equals to one, which enforces activity I precedes activity J. So this simple example just to show the general idea of how we add cards based on the problem structure analysis. So with the further exploration of the global cards, the experimental results got improved. And uh, here I'd like to share our latest results. So in this work, we proposed uh, two models. One is a SA-based model. The other one is a percentile sample model called MBAX and Bacchus, uh, short for Bender's Accelerated Cut Creation for handling uncertainty in scheduling. We compile with the best known approach by Varakantham et al. 
in AAAI 2016. We test the benchmarks and uh, generate sample sets based on normal distribution. So we generate two sets of samples. The validation samples are used in the optimization problem for solution generation. So after we have a solution, we evaluate on testing, um, on, we evaluate on executing on testing exam, uh, testing samples. So we have two metrics for comparison. One is the uh, alpha robust span, the other one is the probability of failure. So given two methods, we see method two is better than method one if either of the two conditions can be satisfied. So in the first case, it means that both methods can generate feasible solution, but method two can provide better robust mix band. By a feasible solution, I mean the probability of the solution, the probability of the failure of the solution is no, la is no larger than the given risk. Then we say, at this case, the solution uh, generated is feasible. In the second case, if the first method fails to generate feasible solution, but the second method is able to generate great the feasible solution, then we say method two outperforms method one. This is how we compare two methods. Okay, here are the results. So for each column, we compare two methods and uh, we summarize the percentage of instances that satisfies the condition of each row. So from the experimental results, we can see that over a majority of instances, the SAA-based model outperformed the heuristic model, and both the models is, uh, performs better than existing work. So to summarize, in this work, we pro provided MIP formulations for POS generation. And uh, during the generation of POS, the potential risk of failure can be proactively controlled. Experimental results show it outperforms the existing method in terms of uh, probability of failure and robust mix band. And we believe this work can provide an alternative solution for uh, decision makers to handle uncertainty in project scheduling. Thank you. Maybe a um, different definition of the objective. Yeah. In this work, it is uh, time, time related. We also may have a cost or resource related objective function. So in this work, we what we are concerning is the time effect and also the probability of failure. Yeah. I mean, um, the quality of the solution in terms of the percentage, in terms of the probability of execute, uh, successfully execution during the real life, when executing it on the real samples. Um, I wonder if, oh, go ahead. So just a question about the cut generation scheme. Are you doing that once in the pre-processing step, or are you doing cut generation during the search of the nodes? Uh, okay, we have three types of cars. One is the uh, vendor's cars. Um, including optimality cards and uh, feasibility cards. And we have a third type of a card called uh, global cards. It is a pre processing. Yeah. I wonder if you could say something about um, what you mean by robust uh, mix band. Is that an externally imposed uh, degree of flexibility that you're targeting? Uh, okay. Robust mix band, okay, it is a value that we have a certain. Mm, we have, for example, alpha robust mix band means that we have uh, one minus alpha probability guarantee that our solution can be successfully executed before this value. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Okay. So that's not parameterized in any way. That's just you don't you don't establish. Uh, there's no upper bound. 
and they'll have to go out. Any other questions? Okay, I think uh, thank the 